understanding, used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible, the intelligence and insight of both God and men. When we create public displays of glory for ourselves, danger comes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. Welcome to the Quick Study Television Program. I'm glad you decided to join us. It's our obligation and our delight to take you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 each and every year. Well, about this time of year, we run into 1 Chronicles chapter 18 through 20. We are going to focus today on going to our head. The problem with pride, and we learn that, of course, directly from the Scripture as we see the destructive tendencies of pride come along and create a problem, and how we can make that work in our life today to avoid it. Right now, Corey is here with a preview of Bible, Archaeology, and History. Corey? Today, we are going to be taking a look at some of the archaeology and the history of the people group of the Philistines. We're also going to be chronicling David's life. Yeah, the Philistines are mentioned frequently uh, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, and so we're going to study that. It's going to be very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, do you know? Yes. Do you know that another giant in Gath copied Goliath by taunting Israel? What unusual detail was given about him um, besides his extraordinary stature. Are you cheating? Uh, well, no, we're, I'm just, we're just having a Conspiring. sort of... We're having a conversation. No, it's all right. Corey and I are having I think a I know conversation. The <laughs> we're going to continue this conversation. I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly, that's what it's going to be. All right, stay there as we continue. In the meantime, here is Corey with Bible History. people group that shows up often in the Old Testament of the Bible here in the time period of the kings, back in the time period of the judges, and even back in the time period of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the Philistines. Right now, you and I are going to track their history. The Philistines were a people group associated with the notorious sea people of the 12th and 11th centuries BC. The Bible Egyptian records, archaeological findings, and other ancient written records agree that the Philistines originally came from somewhere in the Aegean Sea. They were Greek, likely hailing from the island of Crete. Wall reliefs in Egypt from the reign of Pharaoh Ramses III depict a land and sea battle of these sea people versus the Egyptians. What is certain is that the battle did not end well for the sea people and that the Philistines ended up with a large presence in West Canaan along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. From here, they launched the attacks on Israel that appear in the books of Judges in 1st and 2nd Samuel. What is not certain is how. For many years, the dominant theory has stated that the Philistines settled in Canaan as captured vassals of the Pharaoh. This theory, while interesting, does not account for much of the archaeological evidence. The alternate theory sees the Philistines first taking over their territory in Canaan before launching into an assault of Egypt. Regardless, the Philistines were very much present in Canaan precisely when the Bible records them there. However, a Philistinian presence is also recorded in the city of Gerar during the days of Abraham and Isaac, many centuries before the migration of the Sea Peoples of Ramses III. Because of this, some scholars have claimed that Genesis is mistaken, that 
The mentions are anachronisms, references out of chronological order. Other scholars believe that the references to Philistines in Genesis are a result of Philistinian trade and commerce into the Middle East. Indeed, archaeological support in the way of decorated buildings, pottery, and imported food from the time periods of Abraham and Isaac are found in Canaan. A Philistinian presence before the 12th century is both reasonable historically and attested to in the Bible. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible, and they're all around us. Now, the more grievous temptations of leadership, they are not so obvious. It is also very infectious to those who are under the leadership. What am I talking about? David. Often David is a very wise guy in the ancient 10th century B.C., Israel, but not always. Unsuspecting of prideful seeds growing in his heart, David seems to become very proud of his accomplishments. So in today's study of the 75-pound royal crown that the king put on his head from Ammon, this is a ceremony placed on David's head to, I guess, give him glory over the victory over them. Well, this ceremony tends to feed his ego. This is unwise. Public displays of great victories trends to create conditions one of the greatest sins of ancient Israel would ever undergo under David's rule. Let's study on. First Chronicles 20. 1 through 8. It happened in the spring of the year at the time kings go out to battle that Joab led out the armed forces and ravaged the country of the people of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem, and Joab defeated Rabbah and overthrew it. Then David took their king's crown from his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold, and there were precious stones in it and it was set on David's head. Also he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance, and he brought out the people who were in it and put them to work with saws, with iron picks, and with axes. So David did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now it happened afterward that war broke out at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time Sebekai the Hushathite killed Sippai, who was one of the sons of the giant, and they were subdued. Again there was war with the Philistines, and Elhanan the son of Jer killed Lachmi, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, with twenty-four fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. First Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Now, the time is about 1015 B.C., so that means that this king in Israel reigned about 3,000 years ago. Now, two things I want to start by saying, and that is this, that no scripture is left out of context. In other words, when you read a passage, eight or nine or ten verses, you should read before it and after it to gain the context of the scripture. So I want to mention to you that we are later on in David's reign in kinghood. Also, what we want to learn is that after this comes one of the greatest and grievous sins of David's king career. Now, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. What we're going to study today is the setup and the atmosphere for such grievous mistakes that are made, which we'll study on the next Quick Study program. For that, we go to 1 Chronicles chapter 20, and we begin to explore, and Janice has already read it for you. Let's go back and learn 
what it means when I say don't let it go to your head because David's success was going to his head. Here, beloved, is what the scripture says. Now it happened in the spring of the year at the time the kings go out to battle that Joab led out the armed forces and ravaged the country of the people of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem and Joab defeated Rabbah and overthrew it. Then David took their king's crown from his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold, that is 75 pounds. And there were precious stones in it. And it was set on David's head. So this was a ceremony. Also, he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance. Now, before we go to the study wise point, I want you to understand the scene. This is unusual for David. David is not the kind of king, nor has he ever been the kind of king, to gloat in and glory in the objects and the property of the kingdoms that God has given him to conquer. There is a change in his character here, a change in his performance. Suddenly he sits there and he says, I want that king's crown placed on my head. Now that's the attitude of this. So here we see the seeds of arrogance emerging in the heart of Israel's psalmist. Brings us to the very first point. Danger comes when we create public displays of glory for our own recognition and do not give the glory to God. That is always a mistake and it always places us in spiritual danger when we do so. David would have been well enough to just take the crown, put it in the treasury of the temple and move on and not do, you know, the anniversary and the celebration of the great inauguration of the king's success. It is better to stay away from those types of things and give all the glory and all the honor to God Almighty. Let's go on to verse 3. And he brought out the people who were in it, that is this village, and he put them to work with saws and iron picks and axes. So David did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. Now that also was different in its character. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now before we go to the study wise point, here we see David is building a kingdom of slaves. Now, this is out of David's character. Again, he is letting this go to his head, and now he's becoming, you know, that same attitude Pharaoh had with ancient Israel back in Egypt. I'm going to make a people of slaves. Solomon did it too, and he was wrong. So that brings us then to the next study wise point, which is this Danger comes when we create classes among God's people, demeaning others to promote ourselves. When we create classes among God's people, demeaning others to promote ourselves, something shifts in the spiritual atmosphere around us. Temptation becomes easier to succumb to. We begin to believe our own press. That's a problem. And so here we see these little small character changes uh, in David. God didn't say to do that. God didn't tell David, take the king, the 75 pound gold king's crown and put it on your head and watch every, let, let everybody around you watch and see how great you are. That's not what God said for David to do. He didn't say, I want you to build a kingdom of slaves. Now then, here we learn something even more interesting about David's kingdom that the Bible tells us because the Bible's committed the truth. Verses four to eight. Now it happened afterwards that war broke out at Gezer with the Philistines at which time Sebekei, the Hushaite, killed Sapaya or Sepei, who was one of the sons of the giant, and they were subdued. And again, here's another one. There was war at the Philistines, and Elhanah, the son of Jair, killed Lamai, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose shaft, was, uh, whose, uh, shaft of, whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Verse 6, yet again there was war at Gath, and there was a man of great stature with 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemei, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant of Gath, and they fell at the hands, look at this now, of David and, and by the hand of of David's servants. And that brings me to our third study wise point. We can learn this wisdom. Danger becomes real when we let the blessings of God go to our head. You see, beloved, David was in God's team. He had a team. 
But all of this blessing was going to David's head. But these men listed by name and genealogy right here, they were the ones who performed the acts of valor. They were under David, but they were just as valuable to God as David was. You see the point here? Whenever we believe that God's kingdom cannot move forward without us, we are in great danger of spiritual pride and arrogance. Uh, let me tell you something, beloved. Arrogance and pride is the enemy of God. James chapter 4 gives us a clear distinction. As a matter of fact, selfishness and arrogance of pride, the, the book of James and the great James the Just says, that's where wars come from, James chapter 4 verse 1. And so, beloved, to be an enemy of God is to have personal pride. We must remember at the task and the footprint of ministry which God has called us to, we must move forward in great and profound, real, true, authentic humility. What does that mean? It means what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. I must decrease, John said, and he must increase. Right now, you and I are going to compose a biography of one of the most famous kings of Israel. That, of course, is King David. I hope that you'll find some interesting tidbits that you didn't know before. Take a look at this. The valuable scripture space dedicated to King David is unique and important. The historical books of the Bible aim to highlight important moments, gave a basic timeline of need to know details, and cited fuller accounts of history for interested readers' reference. So when much space is given to one king, there is something uniquely significant about his life. Much of King David's importance seems obvious. He was a founding king of Israel. God made a covenant with David that foreshadowed the Messiah. David's life saw the securing of the land of Israel, the establishing of Jerusalem, and David standardized worship practices. David is portrayed as what we would classify a Renaissance man. Take this reference given by one of Saul's men. I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is also a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. The Bible records David's successes and importantly, his failures. Some of these are spoon-fed to us and some are more confusing unless the reader has a working knowledge of the law. For example, David's polygamy leading to family chaos can be traced back to the laws against polygamy in Deuteronomy 17. Interestingly, this skill of understanding is one attributed to David. A purpose of David's history is to provoke the reader to seek God for understanding. Along with the theological implications, David's life has begun to bolster support for the accuracy of the Bible through archaeology. A military fortress of David's has been excavated that has yielded finds like a written exhortation to take care of widows and orphans and honor the king, content closely paralleled to scripture found in a military outpost. War and godly principles are surfacing together, just as the Bible says they were under David. The Bible is full of people who gained insight and instruction from God through dreams and visions. Does that still happen today? A pagan king Abimelech was warned in a dream not to touch Abraham's wife. A brutal Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, was given a vision of God and the future planet Earth. Jacob was shown a stairway to heaven. What does all this mean? Join Rod, Janice, and Corey in a special one-hour DVD on biblical dreams and visions. We also ask the question, does it still happen today? And if so, what would you expect the God of the Bible to say in a dream based on what we know about the Bible? 
This special Bible Investigators DVD training video also makes a great topic for small group Bible studies. For your DVD video copy of Dreams and Visions on Bible Investigators, send $25 or more to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also order online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. We sum up the details of what's going on in David's kingdom, and it, it, there's a lot of um, history, if you would, uh, after David that they talk about. We run into some interesting. Yes, we do. Interesting details about these Philistine creatures. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 what's the do you know? Well, we're talking about another giant uh, in Gath who copied Goliath by taunting Israel. What I'd like to know is this: what? unusual detail was given about this particular giant besides his extraordinary stature that is in fact there was a couple of legends uh, in the uh, in the city of Gath and others about giants but uh, mm -hmm. what do you think Corey I think that the answer is he had six fingers and six toes he had an extra digit on each one so uh, yeah six on each all hand six on each foot I yes. think yeah, you're absolutely right first Chronicles 20 verse 6 says that he had 24 digits in all which yes. which is crazy. It also mentions that he was uh, part of that whole uh, sons of the giant and the Goliath business yeah, going on there. There was a genetic mutation involved in there. One wonders. Now, this is something interesting. Do you know then that the killing of giants remained in David's family because it was David's nephew, Jonathan, from the son of his brother, Shimei, that killed the giant. And the giant's name is never given. Well, this is a very controversial subject because there are... Uh, it's it's been it's been discredited because people have messed with the photos, but there are discoveries of very large skeletons, mm -hmm. uh, and some people have taken it to extremes and made aliens out of them and so on. But they have discovered these very large men. We're talking 13 and 14 feet verified. Some of them are actually in museums, and so these creatures did exist. These uh, gigantic men did exist, and of course, fascinating stuff. Right. Very, well, very we hear about King Og. Yeah, and his, his big bed. How big was King Og's bed, Corey? I think it was 13 feet. Yeah, it was a bed of iron for mm -hmm. 13 feet. Yeah. A lot of room to big man. jump around. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, big, a big guy. And yet God's people, uh, in this case, uh, David, of course, the comparison of the size between Goliath and him, uh, no comparison. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. I often wondered the, the sword that the little, little David used to cut off Goliath's head what that looked like with him being a small shepherd. And then I were reminded when he went to see Ahimelech at the, uh, the priest. Yes. And uh, he gave him Goliath's sword. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Fascinating stuff. Listen, I wanted to mention to you two things briefly. Okay. Uh, first of all, we are, we are pleased to produce exclusively for our partners the monthly quick study Bible Guide. Now, this is exclusive for our partners only. You cannot get this at Amazon.com. You cannot get it on the Internet. Only through our site if you decide to give. I write this specifically for those who support this ministry. It is a Bible commentary. So I want to take you through some of this. So we have on the Bible commentary every day what you hear, the uh, uh, Wise Guys segment. We also have the Study Wise segment, and we have the Wise at Work segment. All of this for every single day. There will be 12 Bible guides plus 12 discovery letters in which there are articles uh, for, with, for creation, science, Bible history, and so on. If you are a partner with this ministry, and this month for new partners who've never supported before, uh, we're going to throw in a pen. So if you write to us and say, I want to support on a regular basis and I want the Bible guide, then we'll send you one of these pens. There's, there's three of them. There's three different kinds here. We've got a red one and we've got, what color is that? Is that purple? It's sort of a brownish. Yeah, purple. brownish. And, it's and quite nice. we'll send one of these for They're the new nice. partners who join us. Now, some people have asked me this question. Well, what is it that you require for support? I say support in any amount, but they want me to give them a figure. So I've made some suggested figures. Here they are. 
So a suggested donation monthly would be, for example, $10 a month, $25 a month, or $50 a month, depending on what God speaks to your heart. So we want to encourage you to pray about getting this Bible guide. This is exclusive Bible commentary, 12,000 words every single month, one page for each day written only. You can only get it on Quick Study. You can't get it at your Christian bookstore, nowhere else. It's all exclusive and all original material. And so we write that specifically for our partners who support us. We want to send it to you automatically every month. Now our address is PO Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668. 0150, the number down there is 724-733-8336. We do appreciate your support as well worldwide. And in Canada, we have people in Uruguay and Brazil and all other places. But if you're out of uh, the country, write to the Canadian address at the address on the screen. Here's Call to Prayer. Most in this world tend to judge success by personal charm or personal possessions. But the Bible teaches that real power is expressed in the Holy Spirit in us. The fruit of that spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, and faith, meekness, and self-control. When these virtues dominate us, this is real power. Personal pride and arrogance is not a part of God's plan for the believer. God's wisdom is at work in us when we realize that His blessings are meant to grow His spiritual work in us and not to build our own kingdoms. So with that, we pray today, Lord, teach me the discipline of handling your amazing blessings and guide me in absolute humility. It is our purpose also to take you through the book of Proverbs and today our Wise Up segment. Reading Proverbs chapter 14, 21 to 22, here is just one line. Do they not go astray who devise evil? But mercy and truth belongs to those who devise good. Mercy and truth, according to Proverbs chapter 16, is also that which really changes the world. It is by mercy and truth that men depart from evil, by the fear of God that men depart from evil. Mercy and truth in Proverbs 3 says, don't let them move from you. Keep them bound around your neck. Mercy and truth. Jesus came in truth and mercy. And he came for you and me. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And he says to you today, come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden with religion. I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ is about knowing him personally, knowing God personally, not about a ritual or a religion. I encourage you to come to Jesus. Know his mercy today. Give your life to him today. Pray and say, Jesus, I need you in my life today. I need some of that mercy and I need a lot of truth. If you pray and you're serious, God will change everything.